If you're like me, you probably communicate more through the internet than by actually talking with people in real life. But when doing that, I expect that my messages will only be read by the person I'm talking to and not by some other random dude on the internet. But when you think about it, your message has to travel the world to reach the server of the app you're using and back to the person you're writing to. Is it really that unlikely that somewhere on the way the message could be intercepted by a malicious entity? Well yeah, that would definitely happen a lot if these messages weren't encrypted. You see, suppose we have two individuals, let's name them Alice and Bob, who want to have a confidential conversation on the internet. If their messages were transmitted in plain text, meaning in a way that can be decoded by anyone who sees them, a malicious individual could intercept and read the messages by placing themselves somewhere on the path they follow. For wireless communications, simply being near one of the two devices could be enough to catch the radio signal, but there are also many other possible ways. Now let's introduce encryption, which you have probably heard a lot about before. The idea is that before sending a message, Alice, or her device, could modify it in a way that could only be reverted by Bob. A simple but not so secure way is simply to offset the letters of the message by a specific number of places in the alphabet, which can be undone by doing the opposite. The problem is that Alice and Bob would both need to agree on the way they scramble and unscramble their messages, and as they are both respectable gamers who haven't touched grass for 6 months, meeting in person to discuss this simply isn't an option. However, if they just agree on a protocol or key via online communication, the attacker could also intercept that, which would allow them to decrypt all future messages. The solution? Asymmetric cryptography. Currently, we have only talked about symmetric encryption, where one key is used for both encryption and decryption. In our previous example, the key would be the number of places to offset a letter in the alphabet. The idea behind asymmetric cryptography is that we have one key to encrypt the message and another key to decrypt it. The key used for encryption is called the public key and the one used for decryption is the private key. The important part is that these two keys should be generated in a pair where one public key is always associated with one private key and there should be no way to retrieve the private key from the public key. Ok, but how does that help? Well, now Alice and Bob can both generate their own key pairs and only exchange their public keys through the internet. Even if an attacker intercepts these keys, they would be of no use for them, as they can't be used to decrypt messages. If Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he can now use the public key he received from her to encrypt it before sending it, knowing that Alice is the only one who has the private key that can be used to decrypt it. And if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she does the same thing, using his public key to encrypt her message. This is the idea behind the RSA crypto system, publicly described in 1977 by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Adelman. Not really sure about the pronunciations here. RSA works by finding three integers, n, e and d, such that any integer raised to the power of e and raised again to the power of d is congruent to that same integer modulo n. If you don't know what that means, imagine a clock with a single hand, like a stopwatch. Let's take a number on this clock, for example 3. If we spin the hand by 5 places, we get 8, which is simply 3 plus 5. However, if we instead spin the hand by 13 places, we don't get 16, which would be 3 plus 13, as that is larger than 12. Instead, we land on 4. This means that 3 plus 13, or 16, and 4 are congruent modulo 12, where 12 is the number of places on the clock. If we have a number larger than 12, like 14, we can still place it on the clock. In this case, 14 is 12, one full rotation on the clock, plus 2, so we land on 2. Mathematically, we can say that 14 and 2 are congruent modulo 12. For those using the 24 hour time format, this relationship should be familiar, as in the system, 14 o'clock is 2 pm. 
Let's stop wasting hours talking about time and instead apply this to the RSA equation. This equation only means that if you were to calculate m to the power of e, then raise to the power of d and place it on the clock with n places, it would be at the same spot as m itself, as if the two powers somehow cancelled each other out on such a looping number system. This is exactly what we need, because it means we can encrypt the message by raising it to the power of e and decrypt it again by raising it to the power of d. There we have it, asymmetric encryption. That was easy. Well, finding the equation is the easy part. The challenge is figuring out a reliable way to generate sets of numbers that actually work with this equation, in such that you can't find d, the private key, if you know e and n. This is where prime numbers come in. A prime number, or simply prime, is an integer greater than 1 that can't be written as the product of two or more smaller integers. 8 is not a prime number as it can be written as the product of 2 and 4, so is 15, but 2 can't be written as the product of smaller integers, same for 7, so these two numbers are primes. An important property of prime numbers is that if you take the product of two random ones, you would get a number that can only be factored back into the original true primes. For example, if you multiply 17, a prime number, by 53, another prime number, we get 901. And if we try to write 901 as a product of primes, 17 and 53 will be the only possible combination. No other prime factorization exists. Therefore, the product of two primes is always unique to those two particular primes. However, no direct way is known to calculate the original two primes from their product. We have to try out every possible combination of prime numbers until we find the two that give us the number we had. And if the two prime numbers are really large, it is practically impossible to retrieve the primes that were used to construct it. RSA uses this property to create a one-way function where we can easily calculate our trio of numbers from two random primes, but we can't reverse the operation to find the two primes that were used. Let's see how we can generate a new key set using RSA. First, we choose two very large prime numbers, which we'll name P and Q. It is important that we use a secure and unpredictable random number generator, as knowing these primes is enough to create the private key. We then multiply P and Q to get N. N will be part of the public key, so we don't need to keep it private. And as explained earlier, if P and Q are large enough, there's no way to retrieve P and Q from it. We can then compute lambda of N, where lambda is known as Carmichael's totient function. In this case, it is equal to the lowest common multiple of p-1 and q-1. This number is a helper number we use to compute the private key, so we need to keep it to ourselves. We now need to choose e, which is used in the RSA equation to encrypt our message, so it is part of the public key. There are actually many possible values for e, it just needs to be an integer greater than 1 and co-prime with lambda of n. Co-prime just means that the greatest common divisor of e and lambda of n must be 1. Now comes the tricky part, computing d, our private key. d is a number satisfying this equation, which once again involves modular congruence. And there are actually an infinite number of solutions to this equation, however we will simply pick the smallest positive integer. To do that, we can use a property of modular congruence which states that our equation is equivalent to this one, where k is an integer. Now, because e and lambda of n are co-prime, this equation is actually a form of Bezu's identity, which means there always is a solution and we can compute it using the extended Euclidean algorithm. Feel free to look that up if you're interested. There we have it. Alice and Bob can now generate their own key pair this way and exchange their n and e values, which form the public key, while keeping d, the private key, to themselves. Now, if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he first uses an agreed-upon encoding scheme to convert his message to a number, raises it to the power of Alice's e value, finds the smallest positive congruent number with Alice's n value as a modulus, and sends that to her. She can then raise the number to the power of d, and once again find the smallest positive congruent number using her n value as a modulus. If everything was done correctly, 
she should get the number corresponding to Bob's message, which can then be decoded back to text using the chosen encoding scheme. Finding the smallest positive congruent number can also be done algorithmically using modular exponentiation, which thankfully doesn't actually involve calculating the powers themselves, which would be impossible considering how large these numbers usually are. And of course, in reality, Alice and Bob don't follow these steps manually, but rather the messaging app they are using does so automatically, or at least it should. Now that we understand how RSA is implemented, let's discuss why it works. Before we begin, we need to understand two properties in modular arithmetic. First, if we prove that the RSA equation works for both mod P and Q separately, the equation is guaranteed to work for N, as it is the product of P and Q. Second, according to Fermat's little theorem, A to the power of P minus Q is congruent to 1 mod P where a is any integer and p is any prime number that isn't a divisor of a. Let's use these properties to prove that the RSA equation works with the numbers we generate. As stated earlier, d satisfies this equation, which we can rewrite like this. Therefore, ed-1 is a multiple of lambda of n, which by definition is a multiple of p-1 and q-1. ED-1 can therefore be written as H multiplied by P-1 and as J multiplied by Q-1, where H and J are positive integers. So let's prove the equation modulo P. M raised to the power of E, then raised to the power of D, which is equal to M to the power of E times D, is itself equal to M to the power of ED-1 times M. And remember that ed-1 can be written as h times p-1. Here again, we can use the properties of exponents to rewrite the number like this. Now, because p is a prime number, and because it should be so large that it can't be a divisor of m, we can use Fermat's little theorem to say that m to the power of p-1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. We have now proven that the RSA equation is true with p as the modulus. We can repeat practically the same proof for q, with the only difference being that we have to replace h by j, but its value doesn't make a difference. By proving it works modulo p and q, we have proven that it works modulo n, which means we're done. Mathematically, if we generate n, e and d using the rules we saw earlier, the RSA equation will always work. So there you have it. This is how prime numbers keep the internet secure and let you have private conversations with people on the other side of the globe. Although RSA itself is now getting replaced by superior crypto systems, the idea remains the same. Asymmetric cryptography is actually what powers the HTTPS standard, which prevents attackers from accessing the information you exchange with websites. I hope this video, which I made to participate in 3 Blue and Brown's Summer of Math Exposition initiative, taught you something, and feel free to leave questions and feedback in the comments. Also, please check out some of the other amazing videos made as part of SOME2. I wish you a great day, and see you in the next video.